Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I am your host, Photo Joseph, and welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm super excited to take you through some of the new Nick collection. We're going to have a lot of fun with these new tools and uh, show you some things that are new and just show you some workflow ideas of, of how we can uh, do things here. This presentation today is going to be broken into two main parts. The first part, I'm going to do a very, uh, let's call it rehearsed scripted demo of the Nick collection within Photoshop, just to show you the top level features and show you how this works. And this will cover all of the basics quite quickly. We'll then take a little break for questions and then get back into a slightly less script, not script, I don't want to call it scripted, it's just a noted outline demo that I'm going to do where I have a series of images. We'll see how many of these I have time to get into. And I'm going to take these through let's call it my traditional workflow process using a variety of the different tools showing you how I might approach an image with some of these tools and of course showing you features of these tools all along the way so with that all said let's get this show on the road shall we starting off in Photoshop this right here is the brand spanking new palette that we have access to all of our Nick tools this is this is I like to say no longer the first thing you're going to close when you open Photoshop now with the Nick collection installed. This is a attractive palette now that fits in with the, uh, the aesthetic of Photoshop and it actually does a whole lot more. So at its default position, the way you see it right now, it is just a row of colored icons and each one of these represents one of the apps and I can launch into it from here. And notice that I called these apps. You might be more familiar with, uh, com, excuse me, more familiar with calling these plugins. And in Photoshop, they are plugins, they act as plugins, but it's worth noting that the entire Nick collection are actually miniature apps. Photoshop sees it as a plugin, opens an image into it as a plugin and then brings it back into Photoshop. But because it is basically a miniature app, you can actually use these with any tool, no matter what your workflow is, even if it doesn't support a plugin architecture, you can still open the images in these individual tools. So they sometimes I might call them a plugin, I might call it an app, but it is the same thing. It's the exact same tool. It just depends on how you get to it, what you might want to call it. But with that said, this is a mini launcher for these. You can, of course, still get to them from the filter menu, go to Nick Collection and pull your filters up from here. Totally up to you how you get there. But this palette gives you a couple other advantages. First of all, once again, it's redesigned to actually look nice. It's kind of color coded with the Photoshop aesthetic. It'll tuck away nicely wherever you want to put it. But if I click on this little tiny expansion menu here, it opens up to show me a lot more of what's going on. First of all, you'll see that now we have the filter names showing up in here. So HDR effects pro, what is it for? It's for merging multiple exposures. So you have the name and a description, which is great because if you don't use these all the time, you might be looking at it one day thinking, what in the world is say uh, Viveza? What is Viveza? I don't even know what Viveza is. Oh, it's for adjusting color and tonality. Okay, so it gives you just a basic description of what it is. It could be kind of helpful. But more importantly than that, you'll see that some of these tools have a disclosure triangle that opens up to show your favorite filters and recipes. And this is really, really cool because this allows you to access your favorite filters or your favorite recipes for some of the plugins, it doesn't work with all of them, but for the ones where favorites apply, it allows you to access them without actually having to go into the filter. In fact, I can choose down here from this gear menu to apply this filter directly in Photoshop, meaning that I won't even have to go to the filter at all. I can apply my preset, my, my, uh, my recipe, my favorite filter directly in Photoshop without having to launch the Nick UI. Or I can change that. I can change it to go ahead and not launch the Nick collection if I want to. We're actually gonna start with this in Photoshop and then we're gonna change it, uh, change it in a moment. But leaving it in Photoshop, I'm going to start with this photo here. So this is a picture from a trip to Taipei. And let's say that I want to play with a few things. I want, to, I want to experiment. I'm not quite sure where I want to go yet. I want to have some fun. So I'll look over here at my favorite filters. These are the ones that I've favorited in the past. And I'll show you how to favorite these in a moment. And I'll try one. Let's try cross, uh, let's try cross processing to start. So I click on cross processing. And over on the right, you'll see that it has duplicated the layer. It is applying that filter to it. You may have seen the progress bar in the corner there. And just like that, we now have that filter applied to that image. And you'll see here it's on a different layer and it's even renamed the layer, which I really like. It has renamed it to tell me what the preset was. So that's super handy. So, okay, that's kind of cool. Look at that. I, I dig the direction that's going, but I want to try something else. So let's go back to the background. I'm going to hide the new one and I'll try one of my other favorites. Let's try bicolor filters next. So once again, select the layer, click the favorite, it's going to render that out without launching the Nick interface. And now I've got that here in Photoshop. 
we go, okay, this is interesting. It's definitely a bit heavy handed, but you know, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Uh, let's try another one. And incidentally, so let me go ahead and apply one more here called film grain. Incidentally, you could of course select the layer that you had just applied a filter to and apply another filter to that. It'll just render that on top of that and on top of that. So you can work that way as well. Totally up to you. But in this case now, I've just applied three different ones. There's the film grain, there's what the bicolor one looks like, and there's what the cross-processing one looks like. So from a creative perspective, maybe I'm looking at these and I'm thinking, you know, I like it, I like the direction, but what I really want is some kind of a combination of these. So let's, let's mix things up a little bit. All right, I'm gonna just start all over and get rid of all three of these. Let's get rid of those guys. And now I'm gonna change my settings to instead of applying in Photoshop as we were doing, to go ahead and apply in the Nick collection. And I'm gonna start where we left off before. We'll go back to the film grain one in here. We'll take a look at that. With the film grain filter selected, it's going to launch the Nick interface and now apply that film grain where I have complete control over it. So in case you're new to the Nick collection uh, and new to ColorFX Pro specifically, let me show you a little bit about how this works. Over here on the right hand side, we have what we call the filter stack. And you'll see here that I've got film grain with my controls for film grain. So for example, I could take the grain per pixel and make it more, so it's gonna be a finer grain image or make it less, so it's gonna be a grainier image. Maybe I want it somewhere around, uh, somewhere around there. And I can change the softness of the grain and the contrast of the film base and so on. So there's other settings I can change in here. But now if I wanna add another filter to it, you click on the button here that says add filter and it adds an empty filter holder. And you may have noticed over on the left that the interface changed to now show me all the filters that I have access to. So there's a ton of them in here, a ton of different ones. I can choose whichever ones I want. And I'm gonna go down that path I had gone down before. And we'll, we'll go for that bicolor filter to start. So now I've combined film grain with bicolor filter. Now, as I said earlier, that felt a bit strong to me, so I can back that off. Let's take the opacity of that down a little bit and give it just a little bit of a color wash, kind of before and after with that effect. And yeah, I definitely like it, like the way that's going. All right, let's do another one. Add another filter, and I will choose again the same one that I did earlier, that cross-processing, add that. And so now I've got a combination of all three of these. And this is the process of building up a look inside of ColorFX Pro. Add multiple filters, you can adjust each individual filter. You can actually rearrange the filters, which will give you different effects. And you can just play, play, play to your heart's content or come in here with a very specific, clear idea of what you want to do. Now, with all this done, let's just say that I had spent a bunch of time on this. I made this perfect. I wanna save this as a recipe so I can come back to it at any time. To do that, I click on Save Recipe. I'll give this one a name. Let's call it Vintage. Click OK. And that adds it to my custom recipe list. You see it's called Vintage, it's right here. Now notice that each one of these, you may have seen this before, has a star next to it. And if I click on that star, it makes it orange in there and that has now defined that as a favorite. By defining it as a favorite, it's gonna show up in Photoshop on the selective palette, which is really where the power of this comes in. So I've marked this Vintage as a favorite. I've got another one above it that I worked on earlier called Taipei. I'm gonna go ahead and mark that one as a favorite as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and load up this recipe. This applies this recipe. It now overwrites the one that I had just done. Of course, if I did that accidentally, I can just hit Command Z and undo that or Control Z, undo that. But I've now just applied that Taipei recipe to this. Okay, so this is pretty good. I think I like the look of this, but maybe I wanna tweak it just a little bit. So I'm gonna go in here and make some adjustments. Let's go to the high key slider. We'll start with glow and I'm gonna take that up a bit. Let's take it up pretty high. Give it, a, give it a nice bit of a glowy kick in there. And then I'm gonna go to film grain and let's make it, uh, let's make it grainier. Let's put a little bit more grain in there by making the grain per pixel a bit smaller. Gives a little bit more of a grainy look to it. Okay, so this is cool. I like this. I'm gonna go ahead and apply this. Now, anyone who's used the Knit Collection before knows that at this point, I basically just made a mistake because I just created something custom and I didn't save it, which means I'm not gonna have a way to get back and redo that or reapply it to another image later, which could be a problem because sometimes you spend a lot of time designing something and you don't you forget to save it and then it's, it's gone. So there's a new feature in here that allows me to save my bacon here, if you will. Let's go into another image. So I've, I've applied this here. We see that film grain effects applied in there. Let's go over here to another image. And I wanna apply the same look. So I go to my ColorFX Pro palette here. Let's turn on just the recipe. So I'm looking at the recipes. There's the vintage one that I had made earlier. There's the Taipei one that I made and, and marked as a favorite. Um, but we know that Taipei is not right. If I apply Taipei, I'm gonna to have to then go in and change two of the settings. I don't remember what I changed them to. 
Well, look above this. There's one called last edit. And the last edit button is going to launch the filter and apply exactly what was done previously to this image. So now at this point, I haven't lost anything. I've got the effects in here, and now I can save this off as a new recipe if I want to. Or maybe at this point, I decide, you know, for this image, I actually want a little bit less green, so let's just soften up that green a little bit for this photo. I think that'll look better, and there we go. I dig it, click OK, and off we go. So that's the basics of what's new in the control palette itself, the selective palette itself within Photoshop. I'm gonna jump over and I see a couple of questions have come up. We're gonna take a look at those and then I'm gonna go into some more images and we'll deep dive into some of these things a little bit more. All right, first question is, is the menu sticky and placeable within the panels? The menu does not stick to the uh, the Photoshop panels, no. So it's not going to integrate itself within these panels, unfortunately. Um, I, I know this question's come up before. I don't know why that limitation is. I don't know if it's a Photoshop limitation or just something that hasn't been added, but unfortunately, no, it does not. So for now, you can put it wherever you like, and of course, you can collapse it down to make it nice and small um, if you want to. Um, pull away. There we go. Uh, second question came up. Where can you find the selective tool if it doesn't show up in Photoshop? Great question, because often, especially uh, if people aren't familiar with it, they might close it thinking, get this out of my way. And then you're thinking, where'd it go? How do I get it back? Easy enough. Go to the file menu under automate. I know it sounds strange, but this is where it is. Under automate, and here we go. And then Nick selective tool two. It's the same place you'd find the original Nick selective tool. Select that and boom, there you go. And she's back again. So that's that. That's how you bring that back up again. Uh, all right, that's it for questions. All right, well, in that case, we're going to just start having some fun with some of my other photos that I've selected here. So let's see here. I'm going to go and close out a couple of these. And I'm going to start, let's just open this. I'm going to open up a raw image. So we're going to start from the base workflow. And I'm looking for this picture here. Um, so we're going to start from the very beginning. We're starting with a raw image. Now, if you are a Lightroom Classic user, you would have a slightly different workflow and people may have questions about Lightroom Classic and I'm happy to address those as we go so even though we're primarily focusing on Photoshop today if you have questions about the workflow through Classic feel free to drop them in there that's perfectly fine um, if you're using Classic you, Lightroom Classic is your raw decoder which technically Adobe Camera Raw is your raw decoder but it's behind the scenes you're doing it in Classic and then if you want to open up an image into the filters from classic you just right click on it and you open the filter in classic and in case you're unfamiliar with this within classic what you now have with the nick collection 3 is the ability to re-edit a photo later there's a little checkbox that you enable and then once you've enabled that your file your save file becomes something called a multi-page tiff and what that means is that you can go back at any time and reopen that image with that filter still intact and still able to be edited the there are limitations though still. Um, unlike when you're working in Photoshop on a smart object, which is what we're gonna be doing here momentarily, you only have the ability to have one filter be live and re-editable. If you choose to move into Photoshop, which is of course an extra step if you're working from Lightroom, but if you choose to move to Photoshop, you have a lot more flexibility in how many, how you can apply multiple filters and keep them all as what are called smart filters inside of Photoshop, which is essentially the same thing that we're getting in the multi-page TIFF, but we're only limited to one there. So that said, I'm now starting completely from Photoshop by opening the camera in ACR, Adobe Camera Raw first, which is what happens when you just hit Command-O or Control-O open in Photoshop and you choose a raw file. It starts in ACR, you do your base raw decoding, and then you save it out to Photoshop. And when you hit OK, it renders out what is, well, it's, it's pixels. It renders out pixels. You can then save it as a TIFF or PST or whatever you'd like. But to make it able to be re-edited, uh, let me rephrase that, to make it so that you can re-edit your photos, your filters later, you have to convert that to a smart object. But one of the things that you can do from ACR is open it as a smart object, which actually gives you incredible flexibility. But as we're about to see, there are still some limitations in that. So with all that preamble said, let's start off here in Photoshop in ACR. So this is a raw photo in here. And um, I'm going to start by doing just a basic adjustment. I'm gonna actually just auto. It's pretty often what I'll do is I'll start with the auto button and just see what it does. It brings everything into range. Um, it brings your highlights and shadows into range. We'll often lift your shadows, pull back highlights if they're really bright. And it may not give you the most glorious image, but it does give you an image where everything is brought into range, which is pretty important. So I'm starting off with this and um, this is a good start. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit open down here. Now, 
this, oh, actually, let me take that back. I didn't want to open it. I wanted to do that as a smart object. So let me do that one more time. Model and doorway. Um, it, the the auto change has already been saved in there. Now I'm going to open it. You hold down the shift key and it converts to the button converts to open object. Or this is actually something new, I think, in a newer Photoshop. There's now a little disclosure triangle here. If you open that, you now have open as object there. Okay, so this is now opening it as a smart object. What this means is that I can, means two things. It means that I can apply a filter to it, which would be applied as a smart filter, which means I can go in and re-edit that filter at any time. And it also means I can go inside of the smart object and re-edit the raw image. So for example, here on the right, we see there's my thumbnail, this little kind of document-ish icon there means that it's a smart object. If I double click on this, it's gonna open back into ACR, back into Adobe Camera Raw. So if I wanted to do some other changes at the raw decode level, I can do that in here. Okay, and then I hit okay and it just brings me back again. So the first filter that I wanna to apply to this image is perspective effects. And perspective effects is one of the new filters in the NIC collection, but there's a problem. Perspective effects cannot be applied as a smart object. Because of the level of distortion that it's doing, it doesn't apply it as a smart object. So if I try to do it, it's gonna say, sorry, can't do it, Not it cannot be applied as a smart object. Okay, so that means I need to flatten this out. Now, at first, glance, at first thought, you're thinking, well, hold on a second, you just told me all the benefits of having a smart object, and now you're going to remove all those benefits by converting it to a just pure pixels again. So what's the point of this? Well. The point is that we are going to need to do this to apply this particular filter. But once we've done that, we can actually re-enable it as a smart object. Now, it is not going to restore the raw editing capability, but it will give you the re-editable capability of the filters as a smart object. So what this means is you really want to plan through your workflow. So I opened this as a smart object. I can now go in here and right click on it and say rasterize layer, and that's going to just rasterize that out as pixels. But what I didn't plan for on this is when I opened this, I did not set it to be a 16-bit image. If I look at my uh, where are we? image, here we go, image mode, you'll see that this is set to 8-bit, which let's be honest, for this particular image, it's quite flat. It's fine. But let's just imagine this was a higher dynamic range image, an image where I might still have highlights and shadows that I want to recover. I might want to really push the dynamic range of this image. I probably want this to be 16-bit. So I'm going to start this over, and I'm going to show you the better workflow to do something like this. Let me just close this, not save it. I'm going to go back into that image again. And this time I'm going to change it to 16-bit. So down here on the bottom, you see it says Adobe RGB, 8-bit. It's all the information about this file and how it's going to open. I'm going to change that to be 16-bit. And now instead of opening it as a object, I'm just going to go ahead and straight on open it. So you might now be thinking, and rightfully so, well, hold on, but I still have lost my raw editing capabilities. And you have, but here's the thing. If you open up a raw image in ACR and you do your basic level adjustments, and then you open it as a 16-bit TIFF, you're not losing anything. No, you do not have the white balance, um, non-destructive white balance control. So I guess I shouldn't say you don't lose anything. That's basically all you lose. You still have all of the pixels with all the dynamic range, with all the bit depth that your camera would have created. Your camera is not shooting 16-bit. Your camera might be shooting 10-bit, 12-bit, 14-bit, depends on your camera, but it ain't shooting 16. So you have got plenty of room here. You still have plenty of overhead. As long as when you do that initial conversion, everything's in range, you're going to be perfectly fine. So with all that out of the way, now I've got a pixel-based image here that I can apply perspective effects to. So this is a fun kind of a really extreme image here because, uh, because what is actually straight and correct on this image? So this is, uh, perspective effects is a tool for correcting, as you might have guessed, perspective of images, quite often used to correct buildings that are kind of leaning, maybe because you shot with a wide angle lens point, uh, pointing up and you know then your buildings look like they're tilted or you were just standing still to hold a photo but you weren't quite level, you were tilted a little bit. This is for correcting all of that. And I look at this photo and I wanna correct the doorway. But the thing is, this doorway was never straight. I mean, okay, maybe like a hundred years ago it was, but pretty clearly here, there is no normal correction for this. So this is a really extreme image that I'm bringing up just to show you kind of the fun power that we do have within this tool. So we're gonna come into perspective effects a couple of times, but I wanna start by trying to do a basic correction to this. Um, and incidentally, you may have noticed up here, it says no DxO optics module is available to correct this image. Many photos will have a DxO optics module available. That is a combination of the body and lens. That is a unique file 
combining those two pieces, the lens and the body, giving you a profile to do some basic correction for that image. The reason that there is no optics module available here is because this was shot with a vintage adapted lens. So the camera, the software has no idea what the lens was. It's completely manual. So that's why it's like that. It's also why this image is a little bit soft. It's just the look of the lens that I used when I shot this. So with that said, let's try a auto perspective. I'm gonna hit the auto button and see what happens. And I mean, the door, the top of the roof might be straight, but now the door's even weirder. So that's that's not gonna do it. So let's, let's not do that. Let's undo that, I'll reset that. With perspective effects, you have four different ways of correcting the image. You can correct it based off of vertical lines. So if what I care about are the vertical lines, I could do that, which actually might work pretty well for this image. I could straighten the doorway, but then the roof is definitely gonna go wonky. I can correct it based off of horizontal only. So if I wanna say, right, these are the horizontal lines, I can do that and then let the verticals fall where they may. Or I can go to a square one, which could actually work quite well for this image. Um, and this is where we're gonna start. And to do this, I would, to make the adjustments, I drag these four corners over to the four corners of the doorway. And we're gonna get these precise in just a moment here and use this to define something that should be perfectly rectilinear, perfectly straight. And uh, we're gonna try this to start. We're gonna try it and see what happens. So to do the corrections, you get your lines roughly close to start. And then you go in with this little control right here and you get that in a very precise position. Now, because of the nature of this doorway, it's a bunch of very kind of warped and rotten wood. We may not find a very clean line to base this off of. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of guessing in here, but that's that's just the nature of this photo. Now to get it lined up, as I, as I said before, you click on this dot and you move it around. And when you wanna get it precise, notice underneath the circle, it says press shift to slow the cursor. Right now I am moving my hand, my mouse hand back and forth. Let's call it like an eighth of an inch. I mean, it's a tiny amount that I'm moving. But you see how fast it's going. So it can be quite hard to get it precise. Like I want to get that corner. Where is that corner? You can't get it. Underneath it, it says press shift to slow cursor. Hold down the shift key. And now here's that same amount of hand movement. Actually, I'm even moving it even more now. And you see how slow that moves. This allows me to get very precise with my placement. So the way you do this quickly is you grab this dot, you get it close to where you want it to be. Then you hold down shift and get that into place. Grab it, move it quickly, get it close. I'm actually going to go up here so I can see that line a little better and drop it into place. Now, this one's going to be a little tricky. A um, couple things, some tips on using this tool for a photo like this. At first glance, that looks like the edge of my door. But look more closely at the image. If we look up here, uh, let's actually just zoom into one to one on here. If you look up here, you'll see that we're looking at pretty clearly the edge of that wood panel there. But as this goes down and the wood distorts out, we're now starting to see the back edge of the wood. So all the way down here, that edge there is actually the back of the wood. The actual line that we want is probably somewhere around here. And you know, again, it's it's a little bit um, a little bit iffy where it is. So we're definitely going to be doing a bit of guessing in here. But that's okay. We're going to get that in roughly close. Now let's get this one up roughly close. Now the real challenge is I don't have any idea what my horizontal line is on the bottom. I mean, there's that, but I really don't think that. Is, well, let's, let's go off of that. Why not? I'm going to line this up. This is going to be awful. I can tell already. We're going to line this up roughly off of that there. Okay, sure. Why not? And I hit preview. It, it's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, the doorway looks really, really straight. The roof line is a little bit crooked still, but the door line looks really straight in there. So, I mean, that's actually kind of cool. It feels a little vertically distorted. So I want to correct that just a little bit. I'll do that with the HV ratio slider, just a tiny bit of distortion kind of correct it. Oops, actually going the wrong way. I want to go this way, just a tiny bit, stretch that out. Oh, I think it looks pretty good. I like it. So I'm going to hit apply. Why not? I dig it. There's my corrected. The rooftop's a little bit, a little bit off still. Um, I could redo it and do it based off of that line as well, but I'm going to go with this because the doorway is what I was trying to get and it has done that correction. I think it actually did a pretty remarkable job. Okay, so remember now we started this as a 16-bit TIFF layer. I applied this filter to it. Now I'm going to get creative. So that was my corrective work. I don't need to come back and change this later. That's done. But now I wanna get creative and I want flexibility on my creativity. So I'm gonna right click on this layer and choose convert to smart object. And once that's done, it just takes a moment. You don't get any confirmation dialogue. It just happens. The roof is falling down. There we go. You get this little icon there, shows you that it's done. And now I can start applying different filters to it. So this is where we start to have a little bit more fun. Um, 
let's see here. I'm going to finish up this image before I come into the questions again, and then we'll, then we'll do the questions and move on to the next image. All right, so let's see here. The first one that I want to play with is, um, is Analog Effects Pro. I'm going to use this as my tool to play with here. So where are we? Analog Effects Pro. Click on this, and it's going to open this image into Analog Effects Pro, which is one of the Knit Collection plugins, which is super, super fun to play with. Now, Analog Effects Pro, I like to point out, oh, first of all, we see a dialog here. It's identified, the dialog says that it has identified that this is a smart object and is going to apply this filter, filter as a smart filter. So, okay, thank you. Um, Analog Effects Pro to me is a playground. This is a great place to play where you don't know necessarily what you're, what you're after. I think that Viveza is extremely precise. That's a tool where you go in knowing exactly what you want to do, exactly what you want to change, and you go for it. Color Effects Pro is a bit of both. It is a bit of a playground, but it's also very specific and very corrective. So if you know roughly what you want, or even if you know exactly what you want, Color Effects Pro can be a great way to do that. Viveza's corrections are more about very specific uh, color exposure changes like that. And we're actually going to look at the Vesa in a bit here, where Color Effects Pro has lots of fancy effects to it, film grain looks, and so on. Analog effects is just a playground. This is where you go when you're not sure what you want to do. You just want to make some kind of cool vintagey look to it, and so you start playing around. And there's some great presets in here, like I click on this one, this classic camera, apply this, and you get just what's a cool look. And you have a ton of different adjustments in here. I can go in and change the kind of dirt and scratches layer that's on top of that image. Um, I go to my lens vignetting, let's let's give this a little bit heavier vignette on there. And I just, I go to town, have some fun. And when you're done, you click okay, and it applies this. But remember, because this is a smart object and therefore applied as a smart filter, I can go back in and change this at any time. So if I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking, too cold, I want it to be a little bit warmer and I want to have a little bit less of a vignette, I can go back in and open up that Analog Effects Pro, just double click on that smart layer, smart uh, filter, and it opens up into Analog Effects. And once it's in here, I can make those changes. So let's go to lens vignetting first, and we'll dial that back a little bit because it's just a little bit too strong. There we go. And let's figure out where the color is coming from. We can look at the film type, and film type has a series of, co of color overlays on it. There's a whole collection called Warm, so maybe one of these will do it. A little bit too much. It's a little bit better. Warm that up a little bit. Maybe take the strength of that down a little bit. There we go. Yeah. And there we go. We've redone the image with a much warmer look to it. And it's a playground. Play around in here, have tons of fun, come up with your coolest images, and away you go. And now, when I save this document, because this is a Photoshop document with a, a Photoshop file with a smart object and a smart layer applied to it, I can just save this as a PSD file, and I will be able to come back to this at any time, reopen this, and pick up where I left off, continue to make other changes, and so on. All right, let's take a quick look at questions, and then I will jump back into another sample image. Uh, first question, can you use the Nick collection with DxO Photo Lab if you don't have Lightroom? You most certainly can. DxO Photo Lab does provide you the plugin methodology, and just like Lightroom Classic, it gives you access to the multi-page TIFF. So when you open the file from Photo Lab into the Nick plugin, uh, it will open it as a TIFF file, and then you can check the checkbox that says, allow me to edit this later, and that's it and then you've got that multi-page tip. It is still not the flexible level of Photoshop. What you have in Photoshop is unique, but you have the same thing in Photo Lab as you do in Lightroom. Next question, you start in Photoshop, then go to Color Effects Pro 4, apply a few filters, then click OK, and the image returns to, oops, ah, my, hold on, sorry, I gotta make this window a little bigger. A lot bigger, there we go. Uh, you, okay, you start in Photoshop, go to effect, Color Effects Pro 4, apply a few filters, then click OK and the image returns to Photoshop. Right, if I return to Color Effects Pro 4 with the same image, is the history available from the first session or are you starting again without the history and the filters applied originally? That's a fantastic question. I actually don't know. I never use history, but let's find out. So I open this up. We clearly had made numerous changes to this. And let's see here, what had I done? I had selected a different preset, I changed the vignetting, I applied it, I came back, changed the vignetting and the warmth, the color overlay, and applied that. So let's see how much is left in history. Go down to the history slider, 
Oh, it's all there? It's all there. Look at that. Everything's, I think, wait, is that right? Size, been lens vignette, stretch strength, film type. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this goes all the way back. So there you go. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. Great question. Thank you. I love questions that I didn't know the answer to, but we find them together. Next question. Once one hover is complete, once one, uh, I'm not quite sure what that question is. Could you please correct that question? I'm going to, I'm going to come back, go to the next one and maybe you can correct whatever that is. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, the next question, the straightened image resulted in cropping some of the edges, correct. Can you adjust your canvas size to retain some of the cropped portion of the image? Absolutely. Um, I actually meant to show that to you and I forgot. So let me just do this again. I'm going to open up, not the PSD, I'm going to open, where is she? There we go. The raw photo will start from scratch here. Open this up, go back into perspective effects. I will, I guess I could have shown you this on another image, but let's, I'm just going to do an auto perspective correction. Is that going to help? Sure. And then I go and open up the crop tool. And here you can see how the image was distorted and what was cropped out. So if I wanted, it's kind of hard to see up here, but essentially the way it's cropped, it is cropping it automatically to maintain the maximum number of pixels while initially at least maintaining your original aspect ratio. But you can change all of that. So I can see it says preserve aspect ratio. I'll just say unconstrained and now I can set it wherever I want. So let's just say, for example, this is a good example. Let's say that this little bit of sky over here, I want it to maintain. You wouldn't, but let's just say that I did. Um, so I want to crop this out so that's maintained. But we can see in here there's a bit of no image because there's nothing there. I can go ahead and apply it this way, and then I can go in and Photoshop and clone in the extra data in there. So you can totally do it that way. You absolutely have that control. Go back to the crop. Uh, let's use the bottom as an example. Let's say that I want more of her foot in there so I can crop that down, but now I've lost this edge over here. My choice. I can apply it like this and clone this in, or I could say, well, let's just crop that differently. So I just get her whole foot in the doorway. So total control over that. Absolutely, you do have that capability. Okay. And all right, here's that question corrected. Um, once you hover over the doorway and make adjustments, can you also make perspective adjustments to other areas of the house? So the control that you would have is if you used the the eight point correction, which I look at my sample photos i guess i'm not going into that one but if you uh, you can have complete control over the individual lines instead of doing them as a grid you can do them as four separate lines you can position wherever you want you can only have two horizontal and two vertical though so if i wanted to well, let's just do it let's just do it let me take this in oops i just click, click the wrong tool i'm sure of it sloppy with my mouse hand viveza we'll come back to you viveza don't worry perspective effects um I will do a similar correction that I did before, but instead of using the four point grid, we'll go to what's called the eight point. And this one gives me complete control over these four lines. So we'll put one of the lines on the roof line up here. Let's get that nice and in place like so. And because the only other horizontal line that I really have that I know is the top of the door, I'm gonna go ahead and use that. So we'll put that there and right there and then i'll put the two verticals on the doorway so let's go ahead and position that one on that corner this one again we know it's roughly the edge there and finally this one and i'll go off the inside line there that should be easier to follow position that and position that there we go so i preview that and now it has perspective corrected based off of that roof line and the top of the door and these two lines here so now you can see a massive amount more distortion that's happened to the image and to go back to the question about the cropping this is a great example of i'll go and apply that and jump back into the crop where i can say let's forget about the aspect ratio i don't care and let's get this much of the image in place and maybe i want a little bit more of her leg which means I'm gonna have this gap to fill in here or I'm okay to crop this in a little bit more and you can make your, your corrections like that. So even like this, that's pretty easy to fix in right there. Let's actually try it. Let's just see what, how good Photoshop is. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and apply this and then let's do, uh, let's do a little bit of auto fill in there. Yeah, it's good enough. Probably do a little bit more correction in there. Maybe pull some from there. Oop, that was terrible. One more try and then we're out. It's okay. It's not perfect. 
still do a little straightening in there, but you could rebuild that corner up there that was missing. So yes, yeah, so you had the option to go that way. So lots of different choices in how you do that. Okay, that's it for the questions right now. Let's go into another image. I'm going to, let's close this, uh, close this and open up a totally other image, a totally other image, English, first language, mine. Open this. Okay, this picture, pretty crooked. And you might be thinking, dude, really? Was well, the door gonna run away? How come the image is so crooked? I'll tell you why the image is so crooked. When I shot this, I did not have a tripod, but there was a very nice place to set my camera. However, it wasn't level. So the only way that I could do a long exposure, I didn't wanna shoot at a high ISO. The only way I could do a long exposure was obviously to stabilize the, photo, the camera. And to stabilize the camera, I'd had to sit in a non-straight way. So my choice was to either handhold the camera at a higher ISO and keep it totally straight, or set the camera however I could get it stabilized, do a long exposure, and hope that I could fix it in post. And of course, knowing that I've got tools like this at my disposal, I know I can fix it in post. So that's what I chose to do. So here's the basic image. Let's again do a little auto correction because that's how I like to work. Do an auto, that's a great place to start. And we'll go ahead and open this. It is still set to 16 bit because I know that I'm gonna go into perspective correction. I'm not going to open it as a smart object. And here's the image in Photoshop. Let's launch into perspective effects and see what I can do. Now, so far I've shown you in perspective effects, a whole lot of manual adjustment and getting things lined up just right. There's also the auto, which works really well, not on every image, but it often works really, really well. So perspective, auto, one click, and I think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. So we've got that. That's great. I'm I'm happy with that. So now I'm going to go ahead and save this and it applies this back into Photoshop and I now have my corrected image. Excellent. So now I want to apply Viveza. I want to do some specific, some very specific work to this photo. Before I go into it, right click, convert to smart object. That's what's going to give me that flexibility moving forward. So once that has converted, I will go ahead into Viveza, click on this. Um, once again, I you can dismiss this dialogue. I'm not, I don't dismiss it because if I dismiss it, then next time we do a demo, I'll totally forget that I hadn't dismissed it and the dialogue won't be there for me. So that's why it keeps popping up. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's look at this whole image. There we go. So here's my photo. Uh, there's a couple of very specific things that I want to do. The dark blue sky up there, that kind of midnight blue sky, I want to make that even darker, but only up here in the sky, not all the way down here. There is some lovely detail up in this roof here that I want to extract out of it. I want to highlight this inscription on the doorway a little bit, and I want to bring up the saturation on the red door here. So, oh yeah, and I want to shadow down the bottom here. So those are the things I'm going to do. So if you have not used Viveza before, Viveza is all about the control point. You'll notice in here there's no filters to apply, nothing hanging out on the left. This is all about the control point in here. You have a global levels and curves control, but that is the extent of what you have global control over. Everything else is about these control points. So how do these work? Well, you start by grabbing a control point and dropping it wherever you want. I'll say on the blue sky on there to see what is going to be affected by this control point. I can either enable the mask right here with that little checkbox, and we see now what control points are doing. So again, if you haven't used control points before, what this is is a real-time mask that is built based off of the pixel uh, values and the pixel colors of where you dropped your sample. So in this case, I dropped the sample on that dark blue sky. So it has selected all that sky, and then it's fading out the farther away we get from that dot. This little guide here will allow me to control just how far I want that expansion to go. And you can see that the uh, the inside of the roof in there is not getting selected at all. Again, we're looking at the mask. So in a mask, white is applied 100%, black is applied 0%, and then any shade of gray is somewhere in between. And I go in here and I can adjust that circle size to get the area that I want. I don't want all of the water to get selected. I really want to focus on that sky in the background. So I'll just leave it like that. That's there, let's take my brightness down a little bit and that's now a bit darker, good. Next, I'm gonna do the rooftop up here. I'll grab a new control point, drag that on. To check how big or check where the mask is being applied, again, I can click on the checkbox here or if I hold down the command key that while I'm dragging it, it actually shows what that looks like. On Windows, I believe that's the Alt key will do that for you. And it shows me as I'm dragging that, the mask that's being built. So we can clearly see in here that the mask is being applied to that roof area, which is what I want. 
And in here, what I want to do is play with the structure. So you have in here control over brightness, contrast, saturation, and structure. Come back, there we go, structure. But if I click this little triangle here, you actually have more shadow adjustments, warmth, red, green, and blue channels, and then the hue. So these are all the controls that I have in here. In this case, it's structure that I want. So I go to structure and I'm going to crank that up to pull some of that detail into that roof in there. Awesome. I'm going to do another one here over the inscription. Let's make this pretty small, focus this down, and I just want to add a little bit of light into here just to add a little bit more attention to it, just bring the eye to it a little bit more. Let's do another one on the red door here. Once again, hold down the command key while I expand this out to see what's being affected. So this is interesting here where I clicked, it's not really getting all the red door. So I'm going to move that control point while I'm holding down the mask. And as I do this, I can see what will be affected. So if I go over here, for example, it's not getting the door, it's getting the door jam, not what I wanted. So I'm gonna find the area that I want. And I think, let's go down here maybe a little bit. I gotta find just the right spot to get that. That's pretty good. And now I think I'll bring this down a little bit. I want less of the doorway here that's getting selected. Uh, let's, let's just turn the mask on. I want less of this to get selected and more of this. In fact, if I wanna make sure that this part of the door is not selected at all, so it doesn't get affected at all, I can add another control point and just not make any changes to it. So I'll add a control point to that. Let's hide that mask. And so what this is now showing me is just what this mask will do. And now I'm seeing how it's affecting the doorway and virtually nothing else. So this should work out well. Now I can take my saturation, which is here, take the saturation of that red door up a little bit. There we go. And make that a little bit more saturated. Maybe add a little bit of brightness to it too. So there we go. Let's do a side by side on these. And you can see now the difference between the two. It's all subtle work, but subtlety is key for something like this. You don't wanna go over the top. We now have that darker sky, more detail in the ceiling, a little bit more light on the uh, on the inscription here, the doorway. Oh, that's right, I wanted to do a darken the floor. So let me add one more control point down here, take the brightness down on that floor there. It's a bit too much, maybe right about there, just to draw less attention towards the floor. There we go. Remember your eye, your viewer's eye goes towards the brighter spots naturally. So by darkening some areas, lightening others, you are drawing their attention to wherever you want it to be. Let me take a quick look at the questions here. Next one up, where should perspective effects be placed in the workflow? Before or after noise reduction with the fine? Oh, that's a good one. I would say if you're doing minimal amount of correction, it's not gonna matter. If you're doing quite a bit, <sighs> I would probably do it before. If you had a lot of noise, yeah, I would do it before. Because once you, yeah, I would definitely do the noise correction first. Because think of it like this. If you have a ton of noise, let's say super noisy image, and you do a really significant change, like the one we did to the, uh, the girl in the doorway, the noise will get distorted, right? Your noise pixels, if you will, will be stretched out, and they will no longer look like a noise pattern, which is what Define is going to be looking for to get rid of. So I would say um, I would say do the noise reduction first and then do the perspective correction. Interesting question. Thank you. Next question: How to open the Nick selection tool in Lightroom? There is no Nick selective tool in Lightroom because in Lightroom you um, you don't have well you just don't. <laughs> it's a that's a Photoshop thing. Um, the selective tool originally was designed as an easy way to brush between the filters, so you'd apply a filter onto a layer and then brush between it. Um, that was before that predates all of the, the uh, smart objects and smart filters and the ability to brush in between there, which we're gonna do next, um, by the way. Uh, and so I think in history past, uh, once smart objects became a thing, it was largely just used as a launching pad. Now it's a launching pad still, but with these other features, the ability to get into those presets quickly, but it just doesn't exist inside of Lightroom. So, okay, let's go on to another image. Um, let's see, how are we on time? We only have 12 minutes left. Okay, I'm gonna do uh, two things. I'm gonna show you one very quick thing, and then we're gonna do one more image that we're gonna go a little bit more in depth in. The quick one is just to show another, maybe a non-expected use of the perspective effects tool. So this is effectively a product photo, if you will. Um, I have a YouTube channel, I do a lot of thumbnails, of course, and so this was part of a thumbnail that I was building. So I took this photo of my phone top down and I wanted this to be as straight and clear as possible, but, but it might not be exactly right. I mean, it looks pretty good, but maybe it's not exactly right. 
And so what I'll do is open up this image and use perspective effects to ensure that these lines are totally, totally straight. And I'm using this photo as an example because the rounded corners actually make it a little bit harder to do, but this makes for a great demo. So I'm gonna to go to my four square, my four point perspective tool because this one will, obviously I have a rectangle in here, so this is easy. Get these roughly into place to start. Um, I could actually grab the whole line, that would have made more sense instead of grabbing all the points. So you can grab that line and move it around. So let's get that roughly close. And now you go into line it up and you're going, hold on, <laughs> I've, I've got no corner, man. How am I supposed to do this? So at this point, it's gonna take a little bit of of refinement so what i would say the way my approach to this would be to get it close to start get it close to start and then keep going around again and again and instead of focusing on the point where the crosshair is focus on these lines look at the lines on the edges and the top and bottom that's what you're basing your correction off of so if i grab this and i drag that up if i look at the top line i can see that's pretty well aligned actually looks pretty good on the side as well and then i'll change this one the more that I change them, other ones might get affected and get changed with it. So you may need to go around a couple of times to find this perfect lines. Actually, I think it did a pretty good job there. Maybe we can close this one up just a little bit. In fact, let's bring that whole line over just a hair. Yeah, I think it looks pretty good. And so now I do a preview and we'll see it wasn't a lot, but it did change. And if you're doing this kind of product photography where you've got that um, like this is for a top-down type of a look, that flat lay look. You want everything to be just perfectly aligned, and this will allow you to do that. So at this point, if I was to continue with this photo, um, this composite, I would now take this corrected image, crop that out, mask that out from the background, take the second photo, mask that in, and so on and so on. But this would allow me to get that perfectly straight starting point. Okay, I just wanted to show you that there because I think with things like the rounded corners, it makes it a unique challenge. And then considering that it's not just for, for correcting photos of buildings and so on, using it on product photography like this can be quite helpful. Okay, last image. It's actually this one here, Foggy Road. All righty, so once again, let's do the auto button. Didn't do much, but I'm good with that. Um, I am not going to take this into perspective effects, so I'm not gonna bother, uh, I'm, I'm not going to bypass the option, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna go ahead and open this as a smart object because that gives me that ultimate flexibility later. So let's go ahead and choose open as object. And now I've got, again, that full, flexib full flexibility. Hit the right keyboard shortcut there. Okay, so I've got this image now as a smart object. We see this here. I want to go back to the world of playing and I'm going to do this just in Photoshop. So let me change my settings here to apply in Photoshop again. And I'm going to open up Color Effects Pro 4 presets. Let's go to my filters in here, and I'll use some of the same filters that I had applied before. Let's try Detail Extractor to start. So I click on this. It is going to, just like we saw before, apply the filter in Photoshop without actually opening the NIC plugin. But remember before when we did this, it duplicated the layer? That's because it was a normal layer. It was not a smart object. Because this one is a smart object, the software doesn't have to duplicate the layer to maintain the integrity of the original image. As a smart object, that integrity is still there. So now I've got my smart object and the smart filter below it. Cool. What this also means is I can actually apply another smart filter on top of this one. So let's go for, um, I think cross-processing. Let me check my notes here. I'm sure I choose the right one. Um, yes, I'm gonna apply cross-processing to this. So I click on that and applies this one to it. And it's going to apply this as a second filter. Now, here's the important thing to understand. What I have not just done is added cross-processing to the same instance of the filter. I've added a whole other instance of the filter. So if you look down here, there's actually two ColorFX Pro 4 filters applied. There's the original one that I did and the new one. So if I open up this top one here, this is going to be the cross-processing look, and we're going to see this in the plugin applied, but we're not going to see that detail extractor because it is two separate instances of it. So just important to understand how the workflow works. It's neither right or wrong, it's just that's the way it works, and so it's helpful to understand how, that, uh, how that's applied in there. Okay, so I open this up. Um, let's go ahead and do this, let that render out, and now we're seeing that cross-processing again without the, um, the other look applied underneath it. Okay, so that's something we can do. All right, let's cancel this. 
and I'm going to get rid of these guys and we're going to start over again. This time I'm going to use one of my recipes and I'm going to use that vintage recipe that I had created earlier. So hit vintage. It's going to once again apply the vintage preset as a smart filter uh, without even opening up the plugin. And at this point, you might think, OK, well, what if I want to change it, though? You know, I have to go into the filter. Sure, absolutely, you can do that. But there's another way that you can change things. This filter being applied as a smart filter actually has a mask built into it. This mask defines the difference between uh, a mask layer, if you will, between the filtered version and the non-filtered version. If I, from here, I can hide the effect. I just click on the eye there and it hides the effect. Um, turn it on again and it, it re-renders it, but it re-renders and brings that back in again. But I can go into this mask and actually brush the difference between the original and the affected one. If I, let that finish, there we go. If I just option click on the mask, it loads up the mask and we can see it's just solid white. And you can see that from the icon here as well. If I grab the brush tool, hit B to grab the brush, let's make this nice and big, and it's black, it's already set to black. As I brush over this, you'll see that looking at the mask in here, you can see what it's done. I've just brushed that black into there. And you can see up here that it has brushed away that effect. So now up here at the top, the effect is not applied at all. At the bottom, it's applied completely. Okay, with that in mind, I can now change this mask to paint the effect in or out at any degree that I want to. Remember, black is, in this case, black is uh, cutting a hole through it, so we're seeing the original. White on the mask means we're seeing the affected image, and anything that's between black or white is some grade in between. So what this means, let me undo a couple times, there we go, so we're back to that being white. I'm going to change my mask, uh, my brush color to a middle gray, and paint that in. And so now I've got a slightly reduced version of the filter. If we look at the mask, you see it's gray on there. Go back to this and there we go. Okay, so that's cool. What if I just want to do a global kind of uh, reduce the whole thing back a little bit? All right, let me just undo to go back to white. If I go up here and I change opacity, that's not going to change the opacity of the mask. That's the changing the opacity for the whole layer. And you can't actually change the opacity of the mask because the mask doesn't have opacity. It's black or white. Or somewhere in between but there's no opacity to it so what i really need to do is make this some shade of gray so here's a cool way you can do that with this selected i'll hit command l or control l on windows to bring up the levels control and then my output level right now black is black and white is white but if i take this white slider and i start to drag it down what we're doing is making that more and more gray and you can see the icon changing as i adjust this and you can see the image adjusting to show less and less of that effect so that's one way I can do it. So I could bring that up, let's say right about there-ish. Okay, that looks pretty cool. Now let's add some of it back in. Like up here, I like the way it looks up here, but at the street level, I kind of want more of that original filter. So I'm gonna go back to my brush. Let's make this solid black. Let's make this a bit bigger in here. And oops, not black, sorry, white, I lied. Let's hit the X to swap that over. And I'm gonna paint white into the street down here. And so here's my mask, that's what I've just created. And with that, I've now got that effect applied completely at the bottom. All right, cool. Oh, we're getting somewhere. Now maybe I want to add a border. Let's add an image border to this thing. Well, that's something I would do in ColorFX Pro 4. And I have access to that, right? Because this is smart objects. Let's open up that ColorFX Pro 4 filter and go into here and add another filter to this. So once this is done, we see here that we've got my film grain, by color, and the cross-processing. Remember, this was that vintage one that I created in the very beginning of the demo. I'm going to add another filter in here, and we're going to choose image borders. There it is. Choose image borders. That applies this kind of simple image border to it. Okay. There's a bunch of different types in here. I'm just going to select type 9. I know I want this one. I'll make the size of it a little bit smaller on there. And this is kind of cool, um, but it's you know full-on applied, right? It's this full-on white border, which... I don't like, I want this to be, I want to see some of the original image underneath it. Well, remember, we've been painting a mask between the original and the affected version of this. So what I could do now, well, already, just by applying that, because I've got this gray mask all the way around it, I'm already seeing that applied like so. Right, so that looks pretty cool. But now I can go in and take this even further. Let's take this and make the brush smaller, make that nice and small and about like so and i'm going to take the mask and make it black so that means we are it doesn't go totally black let's go like a dark gray on here and i can start to paint over this edge of the mask to bring some of that back in this is one, something i could do so i could paint down like that or another way you can do this you can um, shift click 
to do a straight line between the brushes. So now I'm just gonna go shift click to this corner, to that corner and to that corner. And there's the mask that I've just applied. Open this up to look at the mask and we can see what that looks like. If I want to adjust the overall opacity of that, opacity said with air quotes, hit command L to bring up the levels, make sure that your mask is applied, not the image, but the mask is applied. And let's change the output levels of that. I can adjust that. You can see my black becomes a little bit more gray and we're changing the look of that. Just incredible flexibility, absolutely incredible flexibility um, in what you can do in here. So this is why working with smart objects in Photoshop is where you have the absolute ultimate flexibility with the Nick collection. All right, let's see if we've got any other questions here and then we're gonna wrap this thing up. Oh, there's quite a few, my goodness, okay. All righty. Um, if you duplicate a control point, let's say three more control points and move them to several parts of the image. Now I'd like to group them all so they change identically. Yes, you can group control points, absolutely. So I'll just take this into Viveza. So now we're gonna add a second smart filter on top of this one. What we're not going to see is the affected, oh, we are gonna see the affected image. I lied. I didn't think we'd see the affected image. Go figure, cool. Okay, um, so there's the affected image. <laughs> In Viveza, let's add a control point. Let's add one to the sky on here. Make that nice and big. And let's say I want to darken that. Cool. Um, and then I'm going to add another one down here. And let's shrink that down. And I want the same thing applied here to here. So I select both of these. I can shift click on them to select them. Uh, try not to drag them. There we go. Shift click on them to select them. And then here. Eh? Well, that was interesting. Maybe you don't have grouping. Do you not have? Oh, no, here. Sorry. Thought I almost lied to you for a moment there. Group, hit group. And now these two control points have the same controls on them. So if I take, let's say saturation and I bring it up, it is doing the same for both of these. Um, let's do something a bit more easy to see. There we go, take the brightness all the way down. It's affecting both of those. So once you group them, I expected to see it here because that's where it shows up in the other filters. But as long as you group them, there you go. And then you can ungroup them at any time as well. And you'll see now that they're ungrouped, you have the same brightness and saturation controls applied to both of those. Excellent, thank you for the question. Um, how to bring up the mask for the control points. You click that little mask icon that was next to the control point or hold down the command or control key on PC and drag the size slider and you'll see that mask in real time. Can we create actions with these filters to have the same filter applied to different images? You can, in fact, if we go back to this website, um, I'm pretty sure I did that at some point in here, did I? Action, actions, report, distractions, uh, action. No, shoot. I know that's something I covered. It was a long time ago. Hmm. Batch. Nope. Hmm. Auto. Nope. I don't remember which one it was. You can. I don't. I know that I did this, but it was a long time ago, one of these earlier ones, so I, I couldn't tell you which one it was, but you can build them into action. So the easy answer is yes. I was gonna try and show you where you could watch it in action. Um, sorry. Mm, can you selectively reduce the effect of a filter by adding control points? Show, yeah, so the opacity slider is how you would do that. It just depends on the tool. Again, every tool is a little bit different in here, but yes, the effect of a, um, of a filter would be, of reducing a control point would be with the opacity slider for that control point. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. That was super fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I know we covered a lot in a short amount of time. Just the way it works. There's so much to do and there's always so much more that I wanna show you, but, uh, but I showed you the images that I did wanna to get to and I showed you everything I planned on. So um, thanks a bunch for tuning in again. Sign up for another webinar. There's, again, if you go to my link, that photojoseph.com slash DXO, you will find links to the future webinars. And there are uh, there are often more coming. So keep an eye on that webpage. You can subscribe and all that good stuff. All right, guys, take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.